You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Because history is not just about the past. History is about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a better future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane for March 31st, 2016. We are coming to you this week from the Louisiana Purchase Studios, located somewhere outside of Boston, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook and Twitter, where my handle is, at In the Past Lane. Keeping us on the straight and narrow, as always, is our extraordinary executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Hey, Lulu, uh, that actually reminds me, I can't seem to find the show log for this episode. Have you seen it? Right in front of you, dude. Oh, yes. And so it is. Let's get things started. It's a beautiful spring day here in central Massachusetts. The days are getting noticeably longer. The daily temperatures are rising. Buds are appearing on the trees and the first flowers have bloomed. Baseball season's just about to start, followed by the Boston Marathon. Ah, spring. It seems to have finally sprung. And for that, we New Englanders are grateful. The arrival of spring and warmer temperatures means... It's an ideal time to take a look at the fascinating and largely unknown history of how Americans invented refrigeration and how it then transformed key aspects of everyday life. It promises to be our coolest episode yet. God, I can't believe I just said that. Anyway, we'll begin with a feature piece on a little-known figure named Frederick Tudor. He's the man who created the ice industry and launched an unending quest for cool. He's known to history as the Ice King. Next in this episode, I interview historian Jonathan Rhys, the nation's leading historian of all things refrigeration. He'll take us deep into the story of how refrigeration has changed our world in ways that we rarely stop to consider. And in our final segment, I'll drop in for a chat at a unique bar in New York City. It's called Minus 5, as in minus 5 degrees centigrade. Everything is made of ice, from the seats and tables to the glasses the drinks are served in. And people are lined up to pay $25 for this, shall we say, cool experience. Okay, people. Fill her up and check the oil. Your journey in the past lane begins now. In the Past Lane is brought to you by George Armstrong Custer Strategies, a Western consulting firm with visions of greatness. Custer Strategies is dedicated to helping clients in their reckless, headlong pursuit of fame and glory. For more information, please visit our website, www.holyshitthatsalotofindians.com. And for a limited time, use the coupon code SCALPED and get 10% off your first order. Custer Strategies. We'll help you go down in history. You may recall that in our last episode... We talked about some old slang terms that use the word Irish, like Irish spoon and Irish confetti. This week, let's start out with another long-gone term, ice famine. What on earth is an ice famine? Well, if you were alive in the late 19th or early 20th century, and the United States had experienced a winter as mild as the one we just experienced in 2015-2016, one of the warmest on record in many places, the newspapers would be full of stories about a potential ice famine. Just listen to this typical headline from the New York Times from February 1906. Ice famine threatens unless cold sets in. 20 days hard frost needed to make a crop. None harvested on Hudson. New York needs 4 million tons a year. Did you catch that last statistic? New York in 1906 consumed 4 million tons of ice per year. What makes this statistic notable is that just seven decades earlier, New York consumed almost no ice at all, and the same was true of the nation as a whole. Clearly, somewhere along the line, Americans became dependent upon 
perhaps even addicted to, ice. How this happened is not merely one of the more fascinating stories of American entrepreneurship, it's also a story of a remarkable transformation of key aspects of American life, especially the American diet. And in the 20th century, this transformation spread throughout the world. This transformation has prompted historian Jonathan Reese, a guy we'll hear from later in this episode, to dub the United States Refrigeration Nation. And it all started with the creation of the ice industry way back in 1806, 210 years ago. Now, before we dive into that story, let's back up a bit to talk briefly about the quest for cold over the last few thousand years of history. Humans have sought the cooling comforts of ice for a really long time. The earliest known ice houses were built in Mesopotamia around 4000 BC. Ancient Egyptians discovered how to form ice crystals in deep pits for the cooling of their food and drink. And in the markets of the Greek and Roman empires, one could buy ice and snow gathered in the mountains. But let's be clear. Only the elites in these societies, the ruling classes, enjoyed the pleasures of ice-cold drinks. It was just too difficult and too expensive to harvest snow and ice on a large scale. And that remained true centuries later in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. Wealthy aristocrats and merchants could enjoy ice-cooled drinks and food during the summer months, but the masses, they just had to endure the heat. In colonial America, prosperous farmers constructed ice houses which they filled with ice harvested from nearby ponds and lakes. But for the common American man and woman, especially those living in cities, ice in warm weather was as rare and expensive a commodity as caviar. That began to change in 1806, when an ambitious Massachusetts man named Frederick Tudor set out to single-handedly create the world's commercial ice industry. After a trip to the tropics, he became convinced that people in warm climates, whether Charleston, South Carolina, or the Caribbean, that they would pay good money for New England ice. And New England had a lot of ice. And it was free. The only costs, and the biggest challenges for this would-be business, was harvesting, transporting, and storing it. Frederick Tudor was the charismatic son of a wealthy family. He was 23 years old, and he possessed an almost evangelical commitment to enterprise. He wrote, People believe me not when I tell them I am going to carry ice to the West Indies. Actually, people greeted the idea not only with incredulity, but laughter. As Tudor wrote in his diary, his plan, quote, excited the derision of the whole town as a mad project. Even his father called the scheme wild and ruinous. But Tudor remained undaunted. He bought a ship, filled its hold with 130 tons of ice cut from a Massachusetts pond, and set sail for the Caribbean island of Martinique. The snickering now spread from his hometown to the city of Boston. One newspaper, the Boston Gazette, reported with glee, No joke, a vessel with a cargo of ice has cleared out from this port for Martinique. We hope that this will not prove to be a slippery speculation. Clearly, they thought Tudor was nuts. Well, Tudor's first foray into the ice industry brought mixed results. The good news was that most of the ice survived the voyage. The bad news was that there were no ice houses in Martinique, so all of his ice melted and Tudor lost more than $4,000, a huge sum at the time. But the next year, he was back at it, sending 240 tons of ice to Havana, Cuba in 1807. He managed to break even on this venture, but he would have to find a way to earn a profit, and soon. The next few years saw more voyages and some success. But then, bad luck and thievery by a corrupt business partner plunged Tudor into poverty and two stints in debtor's prison in 1812 and 1813. As soon as Tudor was released from prison, however, he was back at his ice venture. He convinced partners in southern U.S. cities in the tropics to build ice houses. This ensured his cargo wouldn't melt upon arrival. Tudor also experimented with different forms of insulation to reduce melting in ice houses and on board ships, and he eventually discovered sawdust from sawmills. Sawdust was plentiful and practically free, and it was a terrific insulator for ice. By the early 1820s, Tudor was enjoying modest success, but the market for ice still remained small. Then, in 1825, he teamed up with Nathaniel Wyeth, one of his ice suppliers. Wyeth had invented a dual-blade ice cutter pulled by horses across ponds, lakes, and rivers. This device, a kind of mechanical reaper for the ice industry, cut a grid of uniform grooves in the ice, and then workers, using iron bars, pried loose identical blocks of ice. This method proved far more efficient than the practice of cutting irregular ice blocks with saws. And the harvested ice blocks 
could be stacked neatly for more efficient transportation and far less melting. Soon, Tudor had tripled production, and his profits rose accordingly. In 1833, Tudor sent 180 tons of ice 16,000 miles all the way from Boston to Calcutta, India. Very little of the ice melted en route, and the ship's arrival in India touched off a frenzy for ice. Soon, a group of investors constructed an ice house to receive future shipments of Tudor's ice. In the coming years, Tudor, now known as the Ice King, sold ice harvested in Massachusetts all over the world. In 1856, Ships leaving Boston carried 150,000 tons of ice to U.S. ports and 43 nations all around the world. Are you ready for an amazing statistic that you can use to win a bar bet? Okay, here goes. What product, by weight, was the number two U.S. export in the 1850s? Cotton, of course, was number one. But ice, yes, ice was number two. But no people in the world fell in love with ice more than Tudor's fellow Americans. The tonnage of ice sold by Tudor and a growing number of competitors soared in the 1840s and 1850s. The greatest demand came from American cities. The English novelist and travel writer Fanny Trollope toured the U.S. in the early 1830s, and she later wrote a book called The Domestic Manners of the Americas. And in this book she wrote, I do not imagine that there is a home without the luxury of a piece of ice to cool the water and harden the butter. Demand for ice grew so rapidly that by 1855, residents of New York City were consuming 285,000 tons of ice every year. Now, let's stop a moment to consider where this ice came from. By the 1850s, the ice industry in New England and upstate New York employed thousands of men. Many of these men were farmhands and lumberjacks who were looking for work in the winter months. And they, every year, harvested vast quantities of ice from ponds, lakes, and rivers. Much of this ice was floated downriver on barges to ice houses in cities. But by the 1850s, more and more ice was moved on railroad cars. No body of water was off limits to the icemen, not even Henry David Thoreau's famed Walden Pond. In 1846, Thoreau noted in his journal that a team of burly Irish immigrants had descended on the pond to harvest as much as a thousand tons of ice per day. Now, Thoreau was irked by the noise, but he was also impressed by its implications. He wrote, The sweltering inhabitants of Charleston and New Orleans of Madras and Bombay and Calcutta, drink at my well. Frederick Tudor, the Ice King, died a very wealthy man in 1864. By this time, it was clear that his efforts to make ice cheap and plentiful meant more than simply providing Americans with cool drinks in the summer. Ice had begun to change Americans' basic diet. Before 1830, most of the typical American diet consisted of mainly bread and dried or salted meat. But after 1830... It included increasing amounts of fresh fruit, vegetables, meat, fish, and dairy products. This improvement in the variety and quality of food benefited public health and extended life expectancy. Ice also led to the popularity of products like ice cream. Once the rarest of treats, ice cream became so popular that in the 1850s, a leading women's magazine declared it a basic necessity of life. Ice also delivered an impressive array of medical benefits. Doctors at hospitals discovered that ice could save lives and began prescribing it as a means of lowering the body temperature of fever victims, especially the young. During the summer, city hospitals issued free ice tickets to the poor, and crowds often grew so anxious outside free ice depots during heat waves that free-for-alls known as ice riots erupted. Demand for ice rose every year. The ice box, the forerunner of the fridge, became a standard item in the American home. And the ice man, Typically, an Italian immigrant with a huge block of ice gripped in a pair of tongs and slung over his shoulder became as familiar a fixture on the urban landscape as the Irish policeman. In New York City alone, by the 1880s, about 1,500 ice wagons plied the streets every day. And this was not an easy job. During a typical week, an ice man might deliver as much as 80 tons of ice. Most of it carried up multiple flights of stairs. The ice man's daily interactions with housewives eventually gave rise to countless bawdy jokes about illicit sexual encounters. This tradition was captured by playwright Eugene O'Neill when he titled one of his best-known dramas, The Iceman Cometh. While Americans came to love their ice, they consumed 15 million tons in 1907, they often hated the companies that provided it. In the 1880s and 1890s, a rising chorus of critics charged firms with price gouging and monopolistic practices, sort of like the way we complain about the cable companies today. Ice companies blamed summer price increases on mild winters that produced 
insufficient stocks, those aforementioned ice famines, but the public was skeptical. The worst case of ice-related corporate misbehavior occurred in New York City. In 1896, the city's ice firms were absorbed into a massive national ice trust. Yes, there were ice trusts in those days, along with steel and copper and everything else. And this trust was called the Consolidated Ice Company. Prices jumped 33% that spring, and more than doubled by midsummer. And the public was furious. But in the days when big business operated without government regulation, they had no option but to pay more, or more likely, to do without. Popular outrage reached new heights four years later in 1901, when investigative journalists revealed that New York's mayor, Robert Van Wyck, and other city officials had conspired to create a virtual monopoly for the Consolidated Ice Company. As the price of ice doubled, new revelations showed that the mayor and his brother had been given $1.7 million in stock in the Consolidated Ice Company. Now, these investigations ultimately produced no convictions, but the mayor, hounded by catcalls of ice, 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 whenever he appeared in public, was soundly defeated by a reform ticket in the election of 1901. In the end, America's Ice Age was brought to a close not by reformers, but by inventors who developed refrigeration and ice-making machinery. As early as the 1870s, large beer brewers had begun to rely on mechanical refrigeration. Soon, the meatpacking industry joined them. By 1900, refrigeration machinery was widely available. So, too, was ice-making machinery. The final step came with the introduction of electric home refrigerators in the 1920s. By 1950, the Iceman had become as much a relic of a long-ago age as the blacksmith and the lamplighter. With that in mind, stay tuned for our next segment, an interview with Jonathan Reese, a historian who knows more about the history of ice and refrigeration than anyone on the planet. He will pick up this story we've been discussing and take it into the 20th century, showing how refrigeration continued to transform American life in profound ways. We'll be right back. Imagine the problems they have down there in the jungle without refrigeration. If they saw an ice cube, they'd probably think it was a a diamond or a jewel of some kind. Ice is civilization. Okay, we're back. With me now is Jonathan Reese, a historian at Colorado State University at Pueblo. Jonathan is author of Refrigeration Nation, a history of ice, appliances, and enterprise in America. And more recently, the book Refrigerator. And he's obviously the perfect person to speak with today. Jonathan Reese, welcome to In the Past Lane. Thanks, Ed, for having me. So you've written this fascinating book, a really fascinating book on the history of refrigeration. And I think it's safe to say that most Americans, at least those who have studied a little bit of history, you know that there was the Industrial Revolution that takes place in the 19th century, and then there were these sort of attendant revolutions like the Transportation Revolution that brought us the railroad and canals, the Communication Revolution, most notably the Telegraph, and these take place alongside with the rise of factories. But you have written on a topic that gets very little attention, but arguably is equally important, and that is the Refrigeration Revolution. So tell us about this revolution and how it changed not just American society, but also, in many ways, the world itself. Really, the refrigeration revolution is a couple of different revolutions. The first one that you've already heard about is the beginning of using ice to both consume and to keep the temperature of food down so that it won't spoil as fast. Then later in the 19th century comes the mechanical refrigeration revolution, where the refrigeration gets better and it gets smaller so that it could be used for different purposes. It also gets cheaper so that more people can afford to use it. Sort of like any technological innovation, yeah. like cell phones or anything else, it starts out very expensive and then gradually becomes smaller and cheaper. What I think is different between this revolution and, say, cell phones is that a lot of this revolution is completely behind the scenes. So you get refrigerators in people's kitchens – Uh, around 1925 for the Mm. first time in large numbers. But before that, there's a refrigeration revolution in what I call and refrigerating engineers call the cold chain, which is the production, the storage, the transportation of food from the point of production to the point of consumption. And that one comes first, but it's equally important. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. So what you're saying is the infrastructure, say, for produce that's grown in, say, the center of the United States – 
has to yeah. go not only along rails and physically get to New York City, but it also, if it if it's a perishable, needs to go through a series of institutions or buildings that are going to chill it and keep it cool long enough to arrive in New York City for consumption. Yeah, oddly enough, refrigeration is what makes California, California. Because after mining happens, they go big into farming. And if you couldn't bring the produce of the Central Valley eastward without it spoiling, there would be no reason to farm to such huge degree in places like the Central Valley or anywhere else in California for that matter. So it's it's really intricately connected to all sorts of different food-related issues and just general industrial-related issues that most people don't recognize. Can you tell us about a particular industry? I mean, there's a number of them that come right to mind when you talk that were radically transformed by refrigeration. One of them is the beef industry, yeah. and certainly the beer industry. But So pick one and tell us a little bit about how it is emblematic of this great revolution not just business and technology-wise, but also just consumption-wise and diet-wise. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the, the beef industry first. Uh, it's a classic story. So the, the great meat production revolution in the late 19th century is concentrating both first pig slaughtering and then cow slaughtering in Chicago so that you take the live cows from the west, you drive them north to the cow towns, like Dodge City, Kansas, you put them on the rails, you put them in Chicago, you kill the cow, you take it into pieces, and then you distribute it to places along the East Coast. Before ice came along, you couldn't kill the cow all in one place like that. And so there's all this waste. And indeed, the the cow itself would be uh, dehydrated. It wouldn't eat on the very, very long trip to the East Coast. And if you could slaughter it and preserve the meat, which is all done with ice, by the way. Most people don't recognize that. There's no mechanical refrigeration in a refrigerator car, a refrigerated railway car, until the 1950s, of all things. Uh, So it's it's all done with ice. And then you take it to the East Coast, and that way Chicago beef can undersell butchers everywhere from Boston to Washington, D.C. and beyond. It's a complete transformation of the industry. And without an ice industry, that change wouldn't have been possible. So that essentially is a story, economically speaking, of uh, not just the technology of ice and refrigeration, but also economies of scale so that you can have this centralized production site that can render these millions of cattle and then ship it to all dis- different destinations at a much, much lower cost. And as you point out, then the local butcher is undercut in many ways by this refrigeration revolution. Yeah. So I'm curious about the fish industry because I come from Gloucester, yeah. Gloucester Massachusetts. And so I grew up with, you know, it was one of the great fishing ports in the world and fish was everywhere. Ice was everywhere. In fact, I remember as a kid noting that the biggest ice company in Gloucester was called Cape Pond Ice. Yes. I remember at one point I realized, wait a minute, and they go way back to the 1600s. I remember realizing, wait a minute, they call it, it's a giant factory that produces ice, but it's called Cape Pond Ice. But I also became aware that ice, the ability of ships to take on tons of ice, allowed them to go out further and for longer journeys to gather more and more right. fish before they had to turn around and come back. And that's lo- that's well before mechanical refrigeration, which now dominates fishing. With fishing, if you don't have ice or any sorts of refrigeration, you have to be able to go out and back in a single day. So it severely limits the amount of water you can cover, unless you're going to you know, do something else with the fish, like dry it or right. salt it, which is going to change the taste and the texture. So for fresh fish, what refrigeration makes possible is the ability to just go much, much further and to do it at a much bigger scale with larger boats than you would ever have before that. And so it's completely transformative again. And in some ways, has it's part of the story of the overfishing problem that we see now mm. that it, it allows not only, I mean, boats obviously benefit from radar and I mean, some sonar and more advanced forms of nets to do their job, but they just the fact that they can go out further and keep fish cold allows them to harvest more and to really scrape the vulnerable environmental systems. And that's where the overfishing problem is really, in fact, Gloucester is sort of the case study of overfishing. If you really want to take it to the present, we can talk about what they do now, which is something called flash freezing. Right. So there will be little freezing units on the boat that will, I mean, it's not perfect. People who really know fish say they can taste the difference if it's been frozen anywhere en route to uh, wherever you purchase it. 
but it's much, much better than it was, you know, 50 or 100 years ago. When you can freeze it on the boat, then you don't need to store all that ice, which leaves you more space for more fish. Yeah, and in fact, growing up in Gloucester, I, I promise I won't mention Gloucester anymore, but <laughs> yeah, the, right. uh, you know, you grew up in Gloucester without even knowing it being kind of a fish snob. And so when I grew up, I learned pretty quickly that you don't ever order fish any more than, say, 20 miles away from the seacoast. Whereas today, I've gotten over that a long, long time ago, or say 20 years ago, because today, if I'm in Oklahoma City and I feel like having salmon, I'll order the salmon because I know it's been flash frozen and that it's going to be the chance. The problem with that salmon is probably going to be in the preparation, not in the the fish that arrived on the uh, that they're pulling out of that refrigerator. One of the most important things about refrigeration is that it is the only form of food preservation, with very few exceptions that doesn't change the taste of the product. Freezing can, if you freeze meat, it's gonna affect the the toughness and it'll make it tougher. It won't ruin the taste, but it'll change it. But if you refrigerate something, the only thing that will make it go bad is sort of the natural life of the product itself. The process itself will um, not change the taste. It won't change the texture in most cases. It's really miraculous when you think about it. Right, because if you look at the history of preserving food, it's always involved pretty dramatic changes. So salting obviously changes the texture and the taste of anything. Smoking, pickling, fermenting, all of those things extend the life of food, but the food itself is very different from from the the fresh product that we're we're used to now. One thing I wanted you to delve in before we move fully into the machine making of, of ice is the battle, that sort of transitional battle, that ice, natural ice harvested from ponds and lakes was the first form. And then along comes machine-made ice in the later 19th century, and there's a sort of a battle between the two, and ultimately machine-made ice wins. And I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about how this artificial product actually triumphed over the, the real thing. What I think is really interesting isn't so much the triumph of artificial ice, but the fact that natural ice could persist for so long. In 1880, you get your first really good functioning ice machines. Most of them are built for brewers who use it to make lager beer. And they can make lots of ice, which they use to make beer. And they begin to experiment with selling it to consumers. But natural ice is so cheap to make, and they're so efficient at the harvesting process, that it can continue to undersell artificial ice for like the next 20 years. What happens is that you have these big ice machines that start in 1880, and they're going to replace the natural ice first. But you won't see that with respect to the iceman who does the delivery. He'll just switch over from delivering natural ice to delivering artificial ice. And then the iceman himself won't really disappear until the 1950s or 60s. So there's a good chance that your grandparents had an icebox. But it probably, the ice in it probably didn't come from a lake. It probably came from a big five ton ice machine. Right. And the, and the, but the postcard, those black and white photos of the delivery system still look 19th century. So the, the man with the tongs and the big slab of ice, it's just that the ice now is behind the scenes, as you keep pointing out, is made by a a great big machine as opposed to having been harvested from a, a local lake or the Hudson River. One other thing about the, the fresh versus machine made ice wasn't there a question of purity in that debate yes and the artificial product is is much much cleaner if you took a glass of water and a glass of ice water around 1880 almost certainly when you got to the bottom there would be dirt and maybe a little bit of pieces of leaves on the bottom people expected that in their ice because it was cut from natural sources and even if the water is clean there would still be sediment in it Artificial ice after about 1890 or so, when they really had the process worked out, is completely clear. And they deliberately made it completely clear. They would actually stir up the ice before they froze it so that you wouldn't even have that cloudy bit inside because they wanted it to contrast against the particles that you would find in natural ice. Yeah, that's interesting. And then also connections of natural ice to carrying disease that, I think, was sort of, in many ways, the death blow, at least to the mass production of yeah. of pond ice, because people realized that the machine ice might not be as romantic, but <laughs> it certainly was a lot safer. In my book, I covered the situation, the school kill in the 1880s, and the consumers in Philadelphia just revolted. 
because the water they were making ice out of was just so disgusting. You could smell it when the ice melted. Yeah, not exactly a something you want to put into your summer lemonade or whatever it was. Well, now why don't we shift here in the time that we have left to the advent of the household refrigerator. You already mentioned it, but how does this, having this appliance, and then the other end of it, again, it's this cold chain you keep talking about. Now you have this machine in your house that can keep things cool for very long and fresh for a very long time. It also has an ice maker. But the other part of that story is the rise of the supermarket, where you'll have refrigeration becomes a really key part of that as well. So somehow tie these two things together. How does this transform the American diet and our, our ways of finding and consuming food? Can I step one step before that? Sure, And then absolutely. get to where you're going? That's right. I talked just a little bit about the ice box. So an ice box is literally a box with ice in it, which is why refrigerators are still called in some circles ice boxes. So that's a big wood cabinet with one space for the ice and one space for the food. And you can get some of the benefits of refrigerated food just by having an ice box. The ice man would deliver the ice to your ice box every day. This would keep things like your your meat f- not perfect, but it would keep your meat relatively fresh. It would make leftovers possible for the first time. So you get some of the benefits of household refrigeration from the ice box. But ice boxes are a little disgusting. Being made of wood and all this water, they're impossible to clean. You have to limit the number of times you can open them because if you open the ice box, all the cold gets out, for lack of a better way to put it, and the stuff will spoil faster. So everybody knew that if you could come up with a very small, mechanically run artificial refrigerator for household use, you would make a mint. And so the first ones start popping up around 1900. The first remotely viable ones pop up around 1915. And it's really perfected around 1927 when General Electric comes out with its first mass-produced refrigerator. And it sells extraordinarily quickly, even during the Depression, because people wanted more reliable cold. They wanted cheaper cold because it turned out to be much cheaper, uh, particularly with New Deal subsidized power to run a refrigerator all day long than to pay a contract to get your ice delivered every single day. You didn't have to worry about the iceman skipping you one day and all of your food going bad. And so it just opened up a lot of new worlds. So the first generation of refrigerator owners are all just delighted by this. The ice cube tray is something of a small miracle. I mean, it takes about till 1960, I think, for all of America to have one. But really, the first reliable electric refrigerator is introduced in 1927. And the majority of Americans have their own refrigerator by the end of World War II. Uh, So it's a very quick transition, despite the Depression, because this was an object of such extraordinary value. It saves time for the homeowner. It increases the number of things you can buy. And of course, as you suggested, when supermarkets begin to adopt the product to store their goods so that people can see them, it opens up all sorts of new avenues in diet, probably most notably frozen food. Yeah, which if you go to a supermarket today, and if you're old enough to remember, you know, say 30 years of going to the supermarket, it does seem that more and more aisles are devoted to frozen food, and not just frozen food, but fully prepared meals that are frozen. And that, of course, ties into other social trends, such as more and more women going to work, more and more two-income families, and things of that nature. And the decreased time that we all spend shopping... I mean, you can see in Europe today, most people will go to the market to pick up their stuff once a day, while the average American goes grocery shopping once a week. And they can do that because Americans have the biggest refrigerators on the planet. (laughs) And they store their frozen food and everything they pick up that's refrigerated in that refrigerator. And there's very little decay in the quality of the food from the point of production to the point of consumption because that cold chain is complete. It is, whether it's frozen food or produce, there's some form of refrigeration keeping it fresh all the way down that trip. It's really uh, incredible. It is remarkable how this has sort of shrunk the world in terms of the kinds of things that you can, you can access. Well, we're almost out of time, and I have one last question, which is sort of towards the end of your book, talking about the place of refrigeration today and the questions about refrigeration and its relationship and our relationship to the natural environment. Is there anything we need to think about? 
I take some flack in these circles for being a refrigeration advocate, despite the fact that there is you know, obviously a tremendous threat to global warming. The thing that you have to understand about the effect of refrigeration on energy consumption and its effect on the environment is that refrigeration is just a very small part of overall energy use and the different kinds of things that do contribute to global warming. So just for an example, food waste emits methane in landfills, which has an extraordinary uh, effect on the environment, more so even than just the regular use of coal to power electricity to keep your refrigerator going. So my attitude towards refrigeration in the environment is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It doesn't mean you have to have you know the greatest 35 square foot refrigerator in the world and it has to be packed at all times. But the idea of, say, living without a refrigerator just strikes me as crazy when that would just create more problems all along the line. I'm certainly consider myself to be an environmentalist, and I believe that you know technology can help us to create more energy efficient refrigerators in the future, and I certainly support that. But I would not blame your refrigerator for its effect on the planet. I'd be much more likely to blame your car or your diet than I would the fact that your refrigerator is on 24-7. Yeah, so if you want to make <laughs> an environmental impact, don't get rid of your refrigerator, but maybe stop eating so much beef. Because as mm -hmm. you point out, the greatest carbon contribution is on the production of that beef, not the transportation of it and the storage of it. So yes. Well, thanks. This has been a lot of fun and a fascinating discussion. I want to thank you for taking time to talk to us at In the Pass Lane. Oh, no problem, Ed. It's been a pleasure. Well, Jonathan Reese is professor of history at Colorado State University at Pueblo. He is the author of Refrigeration Nation, a history of ice, appliances, and enterprise in America, as well as the book Refrigerator. And we should point out here that Refrigeration Nation comes out in paperback this April. Jonathan also has a blog called More or Less Bunk, and there you'll find his writings on history, teaching, and education policy, as well as many other topics. Stay tuned, people. We'll be right back. Well, Jonathan Reese certainly has given us a lot to think about. To begin with, this exploration of ice and refrigeration reminds us that technology began to change the world long before the automobile, telephones, television, and the computer. Ice, refrigerated railroad cars, and kitchen refrigerators might not seem as cutting edge or revolutionary when compared to, say, a Boeing 747 or an iPhone. But history, history tells us that they were. These cooling technologies created new industries and radically reshaped others, especially those related to food. And they also changed everyday life. Take a listen. Yep, that's me in my kitchen, preparing a little iced coffee. Seriously, people, it's way too early for bourbon on the rocks. In modern America, we have unlimited access to ice. We don't even think about it. Nor do we give much thought to the fact that at any moment in our busy lives, we can pull frozen dinners from our freezers or pick up a freshly prepared entree at a grocery store, all because of refrigeration technology that began 210 years ago when a visionary named Frederick Tudor launched his ice business. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. Okay, we're back. This past weekend, I spent the Easter holiday in New York City with my family. And while I was there, one of the things on my mind was trying to come up with a third segment for this episode of In the Pass Lane, something to do with this theme of ice and refrigeration. And I wasn't quite sure what to do when I was standing in the hotel lobby. This is at the New York Hilton at 54th and 6th Avenue in Manhattan. And I looked over in the corner and I saw a sign that said minus five. So I was kind of curious about that. And I walked on over. It turns out it's a bar. It's a bar that is essentially in a meat locker. And the temperature is minus five degrees centigrade. Hmm. Seemed like a interesting thing in its own right. And certainly something interesting to talk about in this episode of In the Past Lane. So I wandered on over with my tape recorder. 
and talk to a nice young man about what this bar was all about and why it's so popular. Okay, so can you tell me who you are? My name is AP. AP, and where are we? We are at Minus 5 Ice Bar inside the Hilton Hotel on 53rd and 6th Avenue. All right, so uh, what's the deal with a minus 5 degree Fahrenheit ice bar? Well, it's minus 5 degrees Celsius. So it's Celsius. even colder than minus 5? Uh, yeah, it's minus 5 degrees Celsius, 19 degrees yep. uh, Fahrenheit. It's pretty much a refrigerator made to drink in. Uh, made out of all ice, everything, except the floor and the ceilings. That wouldn't be a good idea. If all you... right. What about like the glasses you get your drinks in? Yes, they... the glasses are made out of ice as well. So anything you want on the rocks, you can get right inside the glass because the glass yeah. is the rock. And so people coming in, obviously, would be freezing cold. So I'm looking here at your coat rack, and you've got all kinds of uh, items for people to wear, like heavy jackets, heavy overcoats and things. Yeah, That's yeah. part of the price? Yeah. Your basic entry fee gets you the parka, the blue coat, and you get gloves, but you can upgrade to a fur coat if you want your pictures to look nice but you don't even have to wear a coat in the summertime yeah. people come in in their bathing suits their whatever they want mm -hmm. and they get rowdy and sometimes they take their coats off inside for pictures <laughs> sounds good and so how long has this bar been going uh 2013 july and we just renovated so we closed down for a couple of months but we just opened back up in november and it's amazing I, yeah. it's very surprising that People will come in here on days where it's like a snowstorm. You remember yeah. the big snowstorm right. we had? We had a line out the door all day. It's amazing. Do you think there's a fascination with ice and with cold? I think there is a fascination with it because people want to know how it's possible for the ice to stay like that. But I think more of it is, like, people realize that when they go in there and they come out, the alcohol hits them faster because their blood expands when they come from cold to hot. So I have a lot of people who come in here solely to see if that works. Yeah. People like science. People like things that they don't understand, but mm. I still don't understand how it stays that cold. I mean, I do, but I still don't believe it. <laughs> well, it is. It's a unique concept, and it certainly seems busy, so it seems like it's working. Well, it is Easter weekend. We're doing an Easter egg hunt, but it usually Saturdays around this time it picks up, and it doesn't slow down until about 1.30. It's amazing, dude. I don't, I don't, I'm still blown back by it. I've been here for like six months already, but... All right. AP, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, there you have it. Apparently, freezing cold bars are a thing. People are willing to pay $25 just to get in the door, and then $15 to $20 per drink for the experience. I guess it's just the latest chapter in the ongoing American quest for cool. Who knew? Well, people, as always, this has been a lot of fun, but I'm afraid we are out of time. I want to thank you for listening, and I encourage you to weigh in with comments, questions, and suggestions via social media and at our website, inthepastlane.com. At this site, you'll also find links, essays, images, and further reading suggestions related to all the stuff we've talked about in this episode. And you can learn more about our guests, correspondents, and other contributors. And speaking of social media, In the Past Lane is an independently produced podcast, so we rely on loyal listeners like you to spread the word. So if you like this podcast please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And please, oh please, take a moment to write a review at wherever you access this podcast. Reviews are incredibly important for pulling in new listeners. So please, take 60 seconds to leave one. Thanks. In the Past Lane has been made possible by the hard work and dedication of our staff. They are interns Arden Chang and Tiffany Mudgett, technical advisors Holly Hunt and Jesse Anderson, photographer John Buckingham, Graphic designer Maggie Salucci, website and social media manager Yolanda Griffin, and our intrepid executive producer Lulu Spencer. Special thanks also to Jay Graham for creating the intro music and to the Free Music Archive for providing the rest of the music for this episode. I'm in the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next week for another journey in the Past Lane. Lulu. You get the last word. Go. You forgot to sign my paycheck. SBI, Snoring Beagle International.